Come on, say it. You're my righteousness. 
Amen. Good morning, everyone. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Man, I am so grateful and so thankful that he is literally my everything. He is all I need. He is all I want, and I trust you feel the same way. To all of you that are uh, gathered together in his name, we appreciate you for being here. Those of you that are watching us by way of Facebook and those of you that are watching us by way of YouTube, we want to say thank you so much for joining us. Remember, for us, it's not just about likes, it's about lives. For us, it's not just about views, it's about the good news. Hit share because you care. Send it out to your family, your friends, and your followers. Help us to build Jesus' brand. I'm telling you, in these days, we've got to share the message any way we can and there's such an easy way to do it now you have 3,000 followers on Facebook you hit that share button it sends it out to all of them you just reach 3,000 people with the good news of Jesus Christ you know um, there's a lot going on in the world that we live in and unfortunately um, even the believers are getting uh, a little uh, antsy getting a little uh, uh, shell shocked and we want to make sure that we're keeping our focus on what we need to keep our focus on we want to keep the main thing the main thing our whole Hope is not in our own lives, in our own selves, in our own abilities. Our hope is in the Lord. Come on, put it in the chat. My hope is in the Lord. And remember, we've been drilling narrow and deep. This is what our fourth week talking about hope, fourth or fifth week talking about hope. And hope is a confident expectation. And if you look at the word confident, um, it has the word confide in it. And people that we confide in are people that we trust. And we confide in the Lord because we trust in him, trust him every step of the way and every day of our lives. So I want to encourage you, all of you today to keep your hope and your trust in the Lord. No matter what it looks like, we win. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Jesus said it like this. He said, in this world, you shall have trials and tribulation. That's church, church talk, huh? Drama, trauma, difficulty, adversity, problems, issues. In this world, you're going to have all of that. But he said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So us overcoming is not dependent on us and what we can do. Our overcoming is dependent upon what Jesus has done and what Jesus can do. As long as we stay connected to the vine, we're guaranteed fruitfulness, we're guaranteed productivity, we're guaranteed increase, we're guaranteed victory as long as we stay connected to the vine. And that's something that we do strategically, intentionally, and deliberately. Come on, put it in the chat. S-I-D. That's my acronym for strategic, intentional, and deliberate. I know at the beginning of the year, the Lord told me that he wanted me to emphasize for the people that he's given responsibility over and to those that are connected to us that we needed to be on top of our spiritual disciplines. Well, what are those? Those are reading your word daily. It's a spiritual discipline. That is praying daily. That's a spiritual discipline. Finding time to worship the Lord. Finding time to sit in his presence. Being a giver. Serving in the kingdom of God. Those are all spiritual disciplines and we have to make them a priority in our lives. I'm always amazed at how people can just make the things of God a priority in their life when they have a major emergency. But when the emergency has been resolved and they're back to business as usual, the Lord goes on the back burner. I want to encourage you to keep the Lord on the front burner. <laughs> Come on, put it in the chat. Lord, you're on my front burner. Why? Because that means that we are prioritizing him and we are giving him the number one place in our lives. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto us. Let's keep his kingdom as a number one priority in our lives. Amen? Amen. Well, are you ready for the word? I know you're ready for the word. Pastor Marisa is coming, and we are going to get into the word for today. I hope you like our new format. We decided to mix it up a little bit for the month of July and do some team teaching, mix up our order of service and everything else. And so we're excited about what God is doing. We think new is good. We think fresh is good. We think variations good. Variety is good. We are excited to be able to bring to you the word of God today. Amen. 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 And so Pastor Roland um, opened up this month, July, with hope, right? Hope is a confident expectation. He just talked about the word confide. We confide in those that we trust. And so we have a confident expectation in God because we trust him. And Pastor Roland said that we first have to be hopeful before we can hope for. That's right. right? That's right. So we have to be full of hope before we can hope for whatever it is that we are hoping for, right? He also stated that 
hope um, brings into target what we are using our faith for, right? So hope brings into target if you're believing God or using your faith for uh, using your faith for healing, for money, for relationships, for whatever it is. Hope brings it into target. So hope is our confident expectation. Well, last week, <laughs> yes, last week we got into hope for marriage. Yeah, you heard it. Hope for marriage, and we had an outstanding time um, last week. And so we want to continue in that hope for marriage. And the first thing we said uh, in our first session last week, we talked about the institution of marriage. And so we went through scriptures in Matthew chapter 19, as well as Genesis chapter 1. And in those scriptures, it established what God's intentions were from the beginning, right? Yes. God's intention was to create male and female. God's intention was for them to join together. God's intention was for the both of them to be blessed, to um, subdue, to have authority and all of those. So we established that it's not society or us that establishes the gender. God has already established the genders, male and female, right? Yeah, yes. We talked about that in the institution of marriage. We talked about that one of his reasons for establishing that is that he wanted male and female to come together and ultimately become one flesh. Mm -hmm. That was the will of God, to become one flesh. Flesh. Another thing we said in, in that Genesis chapter 1 is that he gave them a collective assignment. Yes. He talked about them, and um, uh, he said to them, right, be fruitful, multiply, and subdue the earth. So he gave them, male and female, a collective uh, assignment. We said that God's intention does not change. Whatever, if you want to know what God's intentions are, you just go back to the beginning and whatever he stated, pronounced in the beginning, those are his intentions now. How can we say that? We say that because of Malachi chapter three and six. I am the Lord, I do not change, yes. right? So if you want to know what my intentions are now, my intentions are now what they were in the beginning. And so that was the institution of marriage. In our second session last week, we talked about the integration of marriage. We wanted to get to the nuts and bolts, right? Yes. The nitty gritty. The integration of marriage and we want to continue that today. So I hope you've already tagged your friends, tagged your girlfriends, share, you've put it on your on your Facebook, on your YouTube. Share, share, share because you care, right? Tag your friends and colleagues. And so we're talking about the integration of marriage, Pastor Roland. And we opened up, we said that in marriage there are four areas that marriages are going to be challenged in. Yeah? Yes. A combination of four, one of four. But there are four areas that marriages are going to be uh, challenged in. And we opened up last week with the area of communication. Yes. And we talked about communication, how important that is. And we feel like if you are communicating properly and, and your communicating is becoming more and more effective, that uh, these other three will become less of an issue because you'll know how to communicate in regards to these other areas. So communication is so important. Uh, we talked about expressing feelings as opposed just to facts. Uh, we talked about verbal communication, nonverbal communication, emotional communication, and then the energy that is communicated in uh, uh, our, our body language. We talked about vibes and things like that. So uh, we want to make sure that all of you are communicating properly. Uh, this is not something that's going to happen overnight, especially if you've been uh, communicating uh, uh, poorly. It's going to take uh, uh, patience between both parties. I want to say this, though, uh, because, you know, having a successful marriage, it really takes two people being willing and ready and able to work, okay? So uh, some of you might have a partner or a spouse that is not really um, um, doing all they can to have a good, effective marriage. And so I want to just encourage you, you know, the Bible says in Philippians 1 and 6, being confident of this very thing, that he that began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So if your husband or your spouse, your wife, or whomever it is you're in a relationship with, they're not like uh, as eager about it, just lean on the fact that God said, you, he that began a good work in them, he will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The worst thing that you can do is begin to say what you see, begin to say what you feel. I mean, you, you have relationships and you can talk to people about maybe what's going on in your marriage and things like that, but you don't want to begin to say negative words in regards to that situation and circumstance because the Bible clearly says in Proverbs 18:20. Um, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. So I want to encourage you. It may not be changing. That other person may not even be 
uh, considerate. They may not even be uh, uh, seem like they want to be married. They're just doing their own thing. Never give up on the Word of God and never give up on Father God's ability to change a person's heart. We've seen people, and we have people in our ministry right now who one person was way out there and the other person just kept praying, and now they're both here in church. So I want to encourage you, if that's you, don't give up. Keep hope. Have a competent expectation of God's ability to do a work on the inside of your spouse. Amen. And the uh, scripture that we use for communication was Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, which says, Let no corrupt communication or word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary um, ed edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. We don't use that word nowadays, edification, but that word edification means building up. So when we are communicating with our spouse, it's for the whole, um, whole purpose, sole purpose of building up, right? Yes. We want to build up the relationship so we have to communicate. And we gave the um, illustration, the example of using I statements, Pastor Roland. And what is an I statement when you're verbally communicating? Right, when you tell the person, I feel, as opposed to attacking the person and starting your sentence off with you, you want to start your sentence off with I. I feel uh, miserable when you don't do X, Y, and Z, okay? And um, the other person has to hear you out, repeat what you say to make sure what they're hearing is what you're saying, and then you come up with a strategy to move forward. Mm -hmm. That's it in a nutshell. You got to go back and listen to last week. We got to get into our new information yes, for you today. you got to go back and look at, uh, listen to it last week. So this week, yes. point number two, Pastor Roland, there are four areas that will challenge every marriage. We talked about about communication last week point number two that will challenge your marriage is money 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 honey money. right money and i put in my notes romance without finance is a nuisance hello somebody put fire in the chat put some claps in the chat you know it's the truth right romance without finance is a nuisance so when we are married right mm -hmm. and um we have uh, goals that we want to reach. We want, there are things that we want to accomplish, Pastor Roland. Yes. Those things in life take money. The Bible says that money answers all things. That's Ecclesiastes 10 and 19. Ecclesiastes 10 and 19. I'll turn there right. You talk, Pastor Roland. Okay, so when we're talking about money, the first thing we want to talk about is, is budgeting. You have to be on the same page. You and your spouse have to be on the same page in regards to finances, okay? Now, it can get kind of funky when you're talking about how um, she's spending money or you're talking about how he's spending money. It can get kind of tense. It can get kind of aggressive. It can get kind of uh, uncomfortable. So that's why we went with communication first. You've got to communicate how you're feeling in regards to this money, and you've got to come up with a plan that's going to work for the best of you. I'm telling for the both of you excuse me you have to make sure that you understand the purpose of money um, how you're going to honor the Lord with your money how you're going to invest money how you're going to save money how you're going to spend money all of those things are going to happen now it's not going to happen overnight and it's not going to happen just because you want it to you got to sit down and have a plan of action have a family meeting where you talk about money and you have to talk about money the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 19 a feast is made for laughter, and wine makes merry, but money answers everything. King James says, money answers all things. Yes. So there's got to be money in this marriage. Put in, put in the chat, money in the marriage. Yes. There must be money in the marriage. And in marriage, you have to know what's most important to um, each spouse, right? So what's most important to a man is respect, right? A husband, a male has to be respected, right? And what's important to a female, a wife in the marriage, right, is security. Mm -hmm. So there must be money in the marriage. The Bible says, if a man does not work, he should not eat, right? So the Bible says that when a husband and wife, in Genesis chapter 1, when we, um, no, I'm sorry, Matthew, that we read last week, that for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife right? Cleave to his wife. So now his strength or his money and all those things don't belong to father and mother any longer. They now belong to that wife, mm -hmm. right? And so we've got to find a way. How are we going to bring money into this marriage? Yes. And so we have to make sure that we understand uh, the different ways you can make money. Now, we're going to write these down. Number one way to make money is through your muscle. 
is you getting out there and just working hard and you can make money through your muscle. That's like lower level. level. Yeah, that's the lowest level, making money through your muscle. That means you're just, you know, working hard, okay? That's number one. The second one is if you work hard and you're working for a company and you're out there doing whatever you do on that lower level, they see you, they like you, and they bring you into the office and say, we really like what you're doing. We want to promote you to number two, management. Once you get to management, you may not be doing that physical labor, the hourly rate or whatever you're making. You may not be doing that. Now you're just overseeing those that are doing that. But in management, there's still not the freedom that you want. Like if you're in management and someone doesn't show up, they expect you to cover for them. If you're in management and people are calling in sick, if you're in management and there's something going on on the weekend, if you're in management and they need you to go out of town for training or a conference, you know, they're not concerned about your family. They're not concerned about your personal life. They're concerned about you managing them okay so that's a little bit better because the money is a little bit better than that bottom line of muscle but it's still not where you want to go mm -hmm. the third one is making money with your mouth mm. you can make money with your mouth and we see that all the time we see people on social media all they're doing is talking about cooking or talking about sewing or talking about music or talking about theater or talking about the weather or talking about other people. They're just on there talking, talking, talking. They're making money with their mouth, okay? And uh, uh, I, I, to a certain degree, make money with my mouth. Words are powerful. Uh, some people write books. It's not a spoken word, but it's a written word. Some people sing songs. The thing that the separate, the separates the um, management from the mouth is that with the mouth, it allows you to make money over and over and over and over again and only work once. Mm -hmm. So in other words, go ahead. You can only do it once. Only do it once, yes. So in other words, if I'm a singer, I can sing a song, or if I'm a songwriter, I can write the song, and I can sell that song over and over and over again. Have you ever been watching a commercial, and the, the commercial, the background music for the commercial is a song you remember growing up, like ABC from Michael Jackson? Anytime they play that song, they get paid. Now, that song was probably written in, what, the late 60s, early 70s, but the uh, estate of Michael, the estate of Michael Jackson and the rights to that continues to generate income. So that's one of the main things between management and um, your mouth is that you can do it one time and get paid over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And what's the highest level? And then the highest level is using your mind. Mm -hmm. Now, when you combine your mind, your mind, <laughs> when you combine your mind and your mouth, yes. now you're talking about generating income when you're asleep at night. Now you're talking about generating income when you're on vacation. Now you're talking about generating income and you're not at work, right? Most people work, 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 get paid. Work, 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 get paid. We want you to flip that and now work, get paid, get paid, get paid, get paid, get paid, get paid, get paid. Work, Get paid, get paid, get paid, get paid, get paid, get paid. So when we're talking about money, mm -hmm. it's not just how much money you make, yeah. it's how much money you can keep. How much money do you get to keep? So when we're talking about getting together with our spouse and we're setting this budget, we're gonna look at our income, right? Where, how much money does this household bring in from all of its streams, whether it be muscle, mind, mouth, right? Uh, management. Uh, management. How much money does this household bring in? This is the income. Then we have to write down all of the expenses is how much money leaves this household, right? Write down all of the expenses, and at the end, we hope that we have um, some money left over. We call that a profit. But when you first start off, oftentimes you don't have money, right? You're in the hole. You don't have money left over, right? You're in the hole. And so you've got to work to say, okay, now what can we cut out, or how can we increase our uh, the making of money yes. right to cover these expenses pastor Roland said it please put in the chat it's not how much money you make it's how much money you get to keep right yes how much money because there could be a person who makes a million dollars right mm -hmm. but if their lifestyle costs them you know 999,000 uh, $999, to live they're not wealthy. That's right. Right? So it's not how much money you make, it's how much money you get to keep. And then under that budget, it is directing your money. This is so important, Pastor Roland. When we are budgeting husband and wife, we are directing our money. What do we mean by that? We tell our money where to go. 
You know, you hear people say, whoo, money just goes. That shouldn't be our testimony. No, money flows to us, and then it goes where we direct it. So we direct it into the savings. We direct it into the investment. We, watch this. We direct it into tithe. Yes. That's first, Amen. my Pastor Roland. Amen. So the money that comes into us, we first direct it to tithe, and then we direct it everywhere else. Yes. Right? So it's not only knowing what to do with the 10%, but I'm finding, Pastor Roland, with believers, it's more importantly what, what they're doing with the 90. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we want to make sure that we're being good stewards over the money that God provides us. And we know what the Bible says in the stewardship principle is very clear. When we are good stewards over little, God will add more to us. So let's take care of what we have. Let's not uh, try to keep up with the Joneses and try to live beyond our means. Let's sit down as married couples, as families, and determine, okay, what's going to be the best use of our money? I heard something that was very powerful. It says when, rich, when, when poor people or middle class people uh, get like a certain amount of money, they'll say to themselves, okay, what can I buy? What can I, um, what, bills can I pay? what bills can I pay? What can I achieve? They say when a rich person gets money, they ask themselves, how can I use this money to make more money? How can I use this money I just got to make even more money? I've got a friend, a, a close personal friend of mine, and he's a, he's a, 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 a building contractor, has done a lot of work here in, in the Bakersfield, and he does a lot of work out of town as well. And he told me whenever he wants to buy something, he does a special project just for that and pays cash for everything. We visit him and his precious wife. They have a, a house out of town on the, on, the, uh, on, on, the, on the ocean. They have a nice boat out there, and they are just some magnif mag magnificent people, and they they are on the same page when it comes to their finances and they're able to live debt free. They save, save, save. They do projects. They put it to the side and they pay cash for everything. That is a awesome goal to have. And a lot of us are saying to ourselves, we can never do it like that. But listen, you can tighten up your finances. So just take baby steps and move your money um, uh, to the places where it's going to bring the most return and give God the most glory. Okay, so as believers, we're not only, um, we don't just spend, we save right so we save several ways we save for the long term that's in investments we save for the short term that's three to six months of your income somewhere so that when you have to put your hand on it you can all right so let's talk about this in married couples we save two ways long terms that's in your investments and those are bringing the return on investment for you right we also save short term three to six months of our income somewhere so that when we have to put our hands on it we can we are talking about the four things that are going to challenge four areas, four um, four areas that you'll see challenges in some way, somehow, in, during the course of your marriage. Yes. Right. Yes. So budgeting is important. Buying, buying major purchases. Buying major purchases. How do we come together and agree? How do we purchase major purchases? So there needs to be a system in place. Yes, and communication in regards to that. Mm -hmm. On how we purchase major purchases, right? So if we want to uh, make a major purchase, let's say a car is a major purchase, right? Do we sit down and talk about it? Do we strategize to get it? Are we okay um, with one person um, uh, getting the loan for it? Does it take two? We have to strategize on how do we make major purchases and not just one of the um, spouses going out making a major purchase and then coming home and telling the other. Yes. Right? And it's important that we realize how our minds work in all of this. Once you set your mind on something, your mind figures out a way to get it. Mm -hmm. Once you set your mind on, I want that, your mind figures out a way to get it. Mm -hmm. So don't try to figure out the way first and then say, I want that. Figure out, I want that, and then figure out a way, and your mind will start looking for ways. Mm -hmm. That's how your mind works. For instance, if you say you want a new car, I want that brand new Tesla or whatever. I'm, I'm going to get that Tesla. Now your mind begins to go to work figuring out a way where you can get what you want, mm -hmm. all right? So when, when two people come together and they're talking about major purchases, both of you got to believe that that's possible. Both of you got to say, okay, let's put our minds together and come up with a strategy, strategy to make this major purchase. And Pastor Rowan, that goes back to what you talked about last week, compounded potential. Yes. See, when we come together for those major shared purchases, uh, you call it shared thinking, mm -hmm. when we come together for those uh, major or those big purchases, now his potential and my potential come together, our potential is now now compound it and our minds start working on how are we going to get that. Yes. That's compounded uh, potential and that's what the enemy wants to fight. So he wants one spouse out there doing their thing, the other spouse doing another thing and you never bring all of your potential together. 
you're stronger together. Yes, we're stronger right? together. And so the key to the money working right mm -hmm. is the communication. Yes. That's why we started off with communication. Mm -hmm. All right, we start off with communication. We're going to communicate properly. If we're communicating poorly, we're going to break those bad habits and communicate with I statements and come into a plan, an agreement of what's going to be best, whatever area it is. Mm -hmm. This area particularly um, we're speaking about right now has to do with money, and we want to be sure that we're communicating and it's not uh, adversarial. Mm -hmm. We're on the same page and we all want the same thing. And I like Pastor Roland, you know, during the course of the marriage, you know, while we were building income and while we were building our money, right, there would be times like we would want to do something or we would want to purchase something and uh, perhaps we didn't have the money for it right now. We never would say, oh, I'm broke or we don't have it or we can't afford that. We would never say that, right? Pastor Roland, the Lord, I, I, or did you get it from Dr. Hilliard, mm -hmm. Dr. Hilliard shared that with us, that um, when it was something we wanted to do, we didn't have the money for it right then and there, we would always say, that's not wisdom right now. That's not wisdom right now come on put it in the chat that's not wisdom right that's now that's not wisdom right now and so whenever i would say something or bring something up and we were not financially able to do it right then if pastor Rowan said to me that's not wisdom right now i knew what he was saying and then our minds would come together and say okay how can we get to a place where we can do it yes right so don't say you're broke don't say you don't have it don't say we don't never have anything don't say we don't have enough money at the end of the month don't say i'm poor don't say i'll never be rich don't say i'll never be wealthy when you're at a, 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 a at an impasse and you don't have it right then and there, just say that's not wisdom right now. Yes. So this train has left the station, and we hope you're on board, filling us with the communication and the money. We're going to do part two in just a few minutes. Uh, we've got a uh, powerful uh, video uh, that we're going to show, and uh, this is the this is your life, Roland B. Banks video. <laughs> And uh, after that, we're going to make our announcement about my book launch, and then we'll come back um, after that. Amen? Are we ready to roll the video? Amen. Amen. I'm the youngest child born to Robert and Margaret Banks. Roland B. Banks is the name. I was a fun-loving child who played every sport, including ice hockey, lacrosse, camping, fishing, you name it. Never a dull moment. But as long as I can remember, I've been called. I attended John Hill School, grades K through 8, then graduated from Booton High School in Booton, New Jersey in 1985. On to Rutgers University. While at Rutgers, I played football for two years, earning a varsity letter, and also ran track for two years, earning a track scholarship. It was there at Rutgers that my personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ would soar to new heights. At New Hope Church, a campus ministry led by Bishop George and Pastor Mary, my life would forever change. I would never be the same. The Sea Rights would have an incredible impact on my personal life and also lay the groundwork for a life of ministry and loving people. As long as I can remember, I've been called. After graduating from Rutgers in 1989 and the dream of working on Wall Street becoming a reality, there was still a huge purpose void on the inside. I obeyed God, left the East Coast for life in the Midwest. The destination, Rhema Bible Training Center, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. The plan was to train and prepare for a life in ministry and then return to New Jersey to help Bishop Seawright launch Abundant Life Worship Church. As long as I can remember, I've been called. That plan changed the day I met Marisa Johnson, a student at Royal Roberts University. We both graduated and relocated to Bakersfield in December of 1992. As long as I can remember, I've been called. Married on June 4th of 1994, we enjoyed the married life and started our family in 1998 when Raina, AKA Sweet Rains, was born. Then over the span of the next seven years, Roland RJ, Reardon Rio, and Radisson Rattag would be born, two and two. The next step after joining Compassion Christian Center and finishing all of my classes was to get involved. Children's ministry was the perfect fit my love for children is obvious and evident. Next up, youth ministry, and then both together. Oh, it's on now. 03, 07, 09, the date that I would be ordained and installed as the assistant pastor of Compassion Christian Center. I assisted Pastor Johnson, that is Pastor Martha Johnson. I thought I would be assistant Pastor Ted Johnson. Pastor Ted's legacy lives on. Could I be the son he never had? Married to his daughter that's just like him, Pastor Martha took her home for a season. That's what the Lord said. 
and after she felt her release, she passed the baton. Sunday, March 4th, 2018. A day I will never forget. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. What if I don't believe? It's not the power. The power of God unto salvation. I say this all the time only because God is showing me this all the time. Words are so much broader than what we think they are. Like salvation. When you think salvation, you just think like the forgiveness of sins. Well, if you're in a desperate situation, you need salvation. You need to be saved out of that situation. If you're in a pool and can't swim, you need salvation. You need someone to save you. Isn't that right? If you're in a swimming pool and you cannot swim and you cannot touch the bottom, you need salvation. You need to be saved. So salvation is just not the forgiveness of sins, not making light of that. You know I'm not. But I'm saying it's broader than that. That's why David said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Compassion, our best days and our blessed days are ahead. There's grace for this. Well, that's my life. <laughs> I was going to say start to finish, but it's not finished yet. You know, I had an awesome experience with the Lord. You know, as a man of God and as a pastor, I'm always concerned about the people. And uh, I know um, one of my uh, mentors, an older man of God, says that uh, my job is to lead and feed, and, and the people's job is to follow and swallow. I thought that was cute, and I never forgot that. And so I've always been um, on it as far as being able to feed the people the Word of God. Um, and I can remember being able to teach the Word of God and be able to uh, inspire people with the Word of God for a long period of time. And so I found myself uh, spending the bulk of my time, um, private time and quiet time with the Lord, um, looking for messages and lessons and things to tell the people of God. And, and I, I was corrected uh, by the Lord and saying, you know, you are a child of God first. You're my son first. So you shouldn't just come to me for lessons and messages and for material. You should be coming to me to find out who I am. And I reveal myself to you two ways through my word and through the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And so at that point, I course corrected and I began to have a, a, a new and improved quiet time is what I call it. When I began to go to the Lord and want to be able to um, hear from him for me personally, not just a word for the people of God. And um, that was one of the big um, adjustments I had to make in my own uh, personal quiet time with the Lord. I talk about this often, and it was very life-changing. Uh, the experience I had at that hotel in, in Houston, Texas, when I was at the um, pastors, not the pastor and spouse conference, when I was at the uh, church leadership strategies conference, and I was there. And um, I realized through that whole process, the Lord began to show me things and show me other things about myself. And I began to realize that my somewhere along the way, my self-value and my self-worth was dependent upon how my ministry was doing. That was a terrible um, way to determine your value. And so I began to realize that my value is not determined on the size of my ministry or the amount of people that come or what people say about my ministry. My value is based on my relationship with the Lord. And so I began to look at my quiet time differently after those two big things happened. I began to look at my quiet time. That's the time I spend in the morning with the Lord. I looked at it differently. I looked at it, he's my father and I want to be in his presence just because he's my father and he sent Jesus so that I could have a relationship with him. And so all of these things I did not know were going to be leading me to the point where the Lord shared with me the same things I'm sharing with we, you, the same things I'm teaching you, the same things I'm showing you, I want you to literally show the world. I want you to literally teach people how to experience me in a personal and powerful way. It all came uh, and all made sense when I realized that if my church began to grow, and this is where it all started with me, and for someone else it's something different, you're looking for God to do this, and you feel that when he does that, that you're going to be validated. You're validated because he sent Jesus to die for you, not because you accomplished X, Y, and Z. I came to the realization that my value was not based on how many people I had at my church. My value was based on the price that Jesus paid for me. 
And I realized at that point that if I did not take the time to correct that, that my church could be full and there would be something else that someone else had or something uh, another pastor did and I would be looking at that for value. So I had to back all the way up and say to myself, my value is not based on anything besides the price that was paid for me and that was the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So out of all of that, the Lord had me to document and begin to write a book. This book is called Quiet Time, A Guide to Experience the Lord in a Personal and Powerful Way. And this is part of the journey that the Lord took me on of how I got to where I am right now where I spend quiet time with the Lord nearly every day. There are some days where, you know, we might be traveling out of town, got to get up real early, but even if I'm out of town, I take all my things with me, I take my journals with me, and I spend quiet time in the presence of the Lord. I'm so excited that um, the book has been completed. I've been working on it for a long time right now, and uh, I'm really excited. It's written. I wrote it. So it's language that I normally use. So when you read it, I hope for you saying yourself, oh, that sounds like Pastor Roland. It, it should because I did write it. And um, chapter one is the foundation. Chapter two is the format. Uh, chapter three is the key to Jesus' success. Uh, chapter four is the formula. Chapter five is the materials list. Chapter six is the mechanics. Chapter seven, scriptures and daily confessions. And then chapter eight, Sunday, it's your turn. So this is written in a way where it's like a manual, it's a resource, it actually tells you how to do it. It's just not written about quiet time, it's telling you how to structure it, what you need to do at your house, all the materials that you're going to need, everything that you need to develop your quiet time is right here. I wrote it for people to be able to develop it from scratch. I also wrote it with people in mind that already have a quality uh, pra uh, prayer time or quiet time, but they want to add something to it. There's probably something in here that you're not doing in your own quiet time and you want to incorporate that into your quiet time so I wrote it with um, everyone in mind uh, it's very simple easy read it's not that long and um, I'm sure you will get a uh, uh, a blessing out of it I'm just gonna read just a little bit to you chapter 2 the format the scripture is very clear regarding the importance of spending time alone with the Lord there are many scriptural references that show us the importance of quiet time at the end of this resource, you will find a list of scriptures relative to spending quiet time with the Lord. One of my favorite scriptures regarding quiet time is found in Psalms 5 and 3. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. Quiet time should be considered a daily appointment with the Lord. It's designed specifically for you to spend time alone in the presence of the Lord. Quiet time is very dynamic and consists of various components that fortify your relationship with the Lord. These components include, number one, reading the Bible, or what I like to call feeding my spirit, the Word of God, Job 23 and 12. Number two, confessing the Word of God, Mark 11, 23. Number three, worshiping, Acts 13 and 2. And then number four, waiting quietly on the Lord, Exodus 14 and 13. Consist Let me read that again. Consistently making the Lord's presence a priority in your life will help you to fine tune your ear to hear his voice more clearly and to become more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Acting on what you hear will ultimately improve the quality of your life. Quiet Time, oh, thank you so much. Quiet Time is available on Amazon. We also have um, a, um, some books that have, were being shipped as we speak, and so you can order your copy. There is also a journal that goes along with this. The book is $15. The journal is $12, and you can buy these on Amazon or any other, or any other place books are sold. Amen? Quiet time. A personal guide to experience in the Lord in a personal and powerful way. We want you to uh, prepare your heart and your mind to receive communion at this time. And we are continually to reflect on what the Lord has done for us. Um, 
I was reading something the other day, and it was talking about communion and the uh, importance of communion. And the Bible says, uh, and as often as you do this in remembrance of me. And remembrance was not, um, thank you, remembrance was not uh, um, a memorial. It was a reenactment. That word remembrance literally means a reenactment. So we should see in our minds Jesus being crucified. We should see in our minds him being wheaten, uh, wheaten, beaten and bruised and whipped. We should see those things in our mind as if it just happened like yesterday. That keeps it fresh. And he did all of that for me and he did all of that for you. The things that we do that we're not supposed to do, Jesus has already paid the price for that. The things that we're supposed to do, that we may not do, Jesus has already paid the price for that. And now he's told us to come boldly to the throne of grace, that we can obtain grace and mercy just when we need it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this time of communing together as a church family and as the body of Christ. Father, we thank you and we praise you that you are a good God. You are a great God. You are a mighty God. And you made all of this possible because you wanted to uh, uh, reveal yourself to us in a personal and powerful way. It all started with Jesus, and it will all um, it will all finish and conclude with Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. We thank you that we are washed whiter than snow, and we have been made righteous because of the blood of Jesus. We thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, in the 23rd verse, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. The Bible goes on to say in the 25th verse of 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And it's through his death that we get life. Let's drink together. Amen. Come on, Pastor Marisa. Thank you, Father. Praise the Lord. And now wherever you are, will you enter to worship with us? Thank God for what Jesus has done through, uh, through his shed blood and his broken body. And now we just worship because he's brought us into that family.
bless your name, Jesus. King of kings and Lord of lords. Mighty fortress and deliverer. We worship you, O oh God. We worship you, O oh God. Appreciate all of you. Uh, are you ready for part two of the word today? Say yes. Say, <laughs> say yes. Put some fire in the chat, Pastor Rowan. I'm ready for part two. All right. So we started off with hope um, uh, for marriage, the institution of marriage, and now we're talking about the integration of marriage, how it works its way out in our lives. Uh, we are not um, licensed marriage therapists. We're not licensed counselors. We're not any of that. Uh, we're just two people who have figured out how to maximize our marriage. Uh, we had some great examples of people who have great marriages, and we hope that we're examples to some of you for your marriages, and we've just learned some things along the way. We've read some things along the way. We've heard some things along the way, and that is what we're sharing with you. So we are excited uh, to be able to give you some tips on um, uh, marriage and let you know that there is hope for marriage, mm -hmm. all right? And one thing I want to say is that anytime you see like a lot of controversy in any area uh, of scripture or in any area in the body of Christ, both between like individuals that are believers and Christians or the world coming against us in a certain area, it's always because there is a lot of power that God has invested in that. Whether that be the controversy around the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, uh, being filled with the Spirit, a lot of controversy around that. Uh, whether it be tithing, a lot of controversy around that. Uh, whether it be marriage, now we see a lot of controversy around that. I don't need to be married or what marriage is redefine it. There is power in these things. So we need to focus in and find out what God's original intent is to be able to maximize that in our lives. Amen. So we talked about the integration of marriage and we said, Every marriage is going to um, experience um, some of these challenges, four of these challenges, and we want to make you ready for them. We started with communication because everything else will hinge on your communication in your marriage. And then last session, we just talked about money. Yes. Is that right? And so this session, session number two, we want to talk about challenge number three, and that is children. Put it in the chat. It is children. And the scripture for that is Psalm 127 and 3. Children. Yes, Psalms 127 and 3. This is God's intent, and this should be our viewpoint as well. Uh, Psalms 127 verse 3, it says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Um, uh, I'm going to read that tell you out of the Message Bible. It says, don't you see that children are God's best gift? Mm. The fruit of the womb, his generous legacy. So we have to look at our children as a gift from God, not an inconvenience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not a burden. Children are a gift. And uh, in that message, it says God's greatest gift. Yes. Isn't that awesome? So it's God's greatest gift. So when we're in marriage, there are certain things that we have to look at when, uh, in regards to our children. So here are some bullet points. How are we going to have children, first of all, and how many? Yes, that's very important that you have that understanding before you get married. Uh, I have a close family member that was lied to, and the husband said he wanted children, and once they got married, said, I don't want children, I just lied about it, and it ended up in a divorce. Mm -hmm. It was no fault of her own. Mm -hmm. It was just uh, uh, a lie from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So let's be upfront and honest. If you want one and she wants six, you need to talk about that. Mm -hmm. If you want two and she wants three, you need to talk about that. If you don't want any and he doesn't want any, you need to talk about that. You need to communicate when it comes to your children. Okay, so children, Psalm 127 and 3 are a gift from the Lord. And so we have to determine in that dating stage, right, before we say I do, if we're going to have children. And if so, how many, right? Another thing that we need to look at in marriages is how are we going to blend families? Yes. Blended families. Oftentimes when we get married, um, we already have children. So if I have children and Pastor Roland has children, how are we going to bring this family together? Now, the Bible says children are inherited from the Lord. They didn't say, they have, it did not say that your biological children are inherited from the Lord. <laughs> your biological children are a reward. No, children are a reward. So uh, whether they are my biological children, whether they are my bonus children, because now I've blended a family, the Bible 
Bible says that they are a heritage. And so we are going to work in our marriages not to treat any of the children any differently. Yes, and that's so important. I want to read uh, Psalms 127, verse 3 to you out of the New Living Translation. It says, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. And so God is holding us accountable. I think anything he gives us as a gift, that we're going to have to hold, he's going to hold us accountable, and we're going to have to give an answer to him on how we treated and took care of and stewarded and managed and led anything that he has given us. So that brings us to our next point, uh, the raising and the discipline of children. I'm telling you, this can be the source of much frustration, especially if you have children that aren't, um, uh, really obedient children and the way that you discipline them, the way that you try to correct them, the way that you try to train them and get them back on track, uh, you, the husband and the wife have to be on the same page because if they're not, the children is going to be able to get in between them and cause a problem in the marriage as well as in their relationship with the parents and the parents' relationship with the children. Mm -hmm. So this comes from communication, right? So we sit down and how are we going to raise and how are we going to discipline our children? Whether they be our biological children, whether, whether they are children in a blended family, how are we going to raise and discipline our children? Now, there, come, uh, there are some people who come from, you know, a background of no spanking, right? Yes. Well, that has to be talked about. There's others who come from a background of spanking. So we have to talk about that. How are we going to raise and discipline our children? What are we going to expose our children to? What are we going to keep our children from? This is the, uh, the discussion, and that's why we started with communication. That's right. How old do our children need to be before they get a phone? How old do they need to be before they can talk on the phone to the opposite sex? How old do they need to be before they date? How old do they need to be before we purchase them a car? Are, are our children going to have chores? What kind of chores are they going uh, to be? These are the things that have to be talked about and not just assumed. That's right. And it's important that you, you and your spouse are on the same page when it comes to those things. And it's not through like uh, mind reading or anything like that. It's got to be a conversation about this beforehand and not after. Mm -hmm. These are the children. Um, we have um, couples and things that um, maybe you may have had the discussion before marriage that you wanted children, you're going to have children, and maybe it's been a, a challenge to have children, right? We got to be able to communicate that all the way through the process, right? We're having challenges uh, in, in uh, conceiving. What are we willing to do? Yes. You know, are, are we willing to uh, go through fertility um, options? Are, are we going to adopt? What are we willing to do. There has to be communication about the children. Yes. Um, we talked about how do we handle when our children make a poor decision? Yeah. That's, that's so important because uh, children are just like people. You make poor decisions, they make poor decisions. And so I think when we talk about God's love for us and the unconditional love that he has for us, that should be seen and exemplified in our relationship with our children. We should be able to let them know we love you, but you're making some bad decisions, you're making some bad choices, and there are consequences to those choices. So I think that your child's um, uh, perception of your love for them would never change regardless of the decisions that they're making, but you also need to be able to communicate to them that you're making some bad decisions and this is going to end up all bad for you if you don't choose to make some better decisions and, and get around some better people or do better with your money or whatever the case may is may be. So poor decisions are something that our children are tend to do and are prone to do and you want to be able to communicate with your child um, at a very young age and build that relationship so when they are teenagers or older and they're making poor decisions, they feel comfortable coming to you and at least having a conversation so that you can communicate with them. You don't want your children going through all of these bad decisions and difficult times in their life with no parental support because every time they come to you with something that you don't agree with, you just fly off the handle and just go off on them. So that's something you really want to consider. Um, is you flying off the handle and going off on them, is it worth the relationship? If you, if you get what you want, but you damage your child in the process, then that's something you really have to evaluate, was it worth it? Was it worth it? And um, so, you know, poor decisions, they are a part of life. And um, another thing I want to say is that um, a lot of times parents blame themselves for poor decisions that their children make. And I'm speaking more towards like um, uh, teenagers, young adults, and then even adult children. They're making bad decisions and uh, the parents are blaming themselves. You gotta be real careful if they're adults, you gotta be real careful that you're not taking the blame for bad choices that they're making. Mm -hmm. 
because we teach life is choice driven. Yes. We live and die by the choices we make. And so once our children become adults, right, they have to, they're making choices on their own, right? We can no longer dictate the choices that they are making, right? And so when they choose to make a decision that is maybe contrary to the word of God, we have to realize that life is choice driven. And because of that choice, they're going to um, suffer, right, the consequences, consequences yes. or benefit from that decision. Um, and Pastor Roland, and that begins at an early age with your children. Right. And what I mean by that is like uh, one of the things that I had to learn is how to um, keep my facial expression, right, when the kids would come and tell me something that I'd be like shocked on the inside, but trying not to show it on the outside because I wanted them to continue to come, right? Um, and there are just some things I think that children are just not going to bring, right? Right. And it's funny because we have four children, so I learned some things about my children from my other children. Yes. So I learned something um, from RJ about Radisson that Radisson did not tell me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's perfectly fine. You want your children to be able to talk and communicate with, the, with each other, and you want them to be able to talk and communicate with you. Now, as your children are younger, like elementary age, junior high, middle school, and high school, I mean, you really have to, to, to discipline them. You have to correct them. You have to sit down and talk to them, explain, this is what you're doing. This is why you shouldn't doing it. This is going to be the result of you doing this and lay the whole thing out. It shouldn't just be, I'm going to whoop you because you know better. That's how we were raised, all right? And I know we t ended up turning out you know, pretty good, some of us, but some of us, we resent that, and so we've gone to the other end of the extreme, we just let our, our extreme, where we let our children just do whatever because our parents were just overbearing on us. So there's a balance in the middle. So when we talk about raising our children, we gotta communicate with, with our spouse to make sure that we're on the same page. And every child is a different um, human, being. human being. So what worked for your first child may not necessarily work for your second child. Certain children need to have things taken away. Certain children can just be talked to. Certain children have to be be restricted. We called it grounded. Uh, you guys call it uh, restriction when they can't go out. It just depends. And every child is different. And so uh, we have to make sure that we're treating everyone with fairness. We are treating everyone with that unconditional love. But yet and still, we're setting those boundaries so that our children know that this is the way you're supposed to behave. And if you don't behave that way, you know, it's going to um, uh, uh, have a negative impact in your life. And so parents and mom and dad realize you are their first mirror. So they are watching you, right? So they are watching um, how you handle the things that we talked about. How do you handle communication? How do you handle communication with people on the outside? They are watching. How are you handling your money? Is our family faring well because of the decisions my parents are making with the money? They are watching how we treat um, the children, how we treat uh, all of them. Um, is there favoritism? Favoritism, so they are watching. You are their mirror, so be aware of that. And the whole goal with children, Pastor Roland, is that you're trying to raise the best human, the best individual you can. Yes. With God's help. With God's help. Right? Amen. And so yes. when you see an uh, 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 adult minor, you talked about the adult minor child okay. differences. Yeah. All right, perfect. The differences between how you, um, so with their minor children, right? You're, you're um, raising them, you're dictating, you're instructing, you are um, um, showing. But when they become adult children, then your role changes. Yeah, your role changes. And it's hard for adults because they've been doing these, this their whole life for their children. So then they get to a point and they still want to kind of control what their adult children are doing. Mm -hmm. So you got to figure out how to let them go and let them know, I'm here for you, but, you know, you're an adult now. So you got to figure it out on your own to a certain degree, and I'm gonna help you to a certain degree, but it can't be like you're still treating them like they were a minor child and they're an adult grown with their own family. I like the way you say it, Pastor Roland. When they become adults, right, um, we don't give them advice until they ask for it. Right. When they come and ask for it, then we give it, right? And that's different than when your children are minors. You're constantly giving instruction. You're constantly giving advice, right? That's the training season, right? So you just have to know that your job, and to remember, as parents, we are stewards over the children. Yes, they're, right? not, they're not ours. They're not ours. And so a steward takes care of something that belongs to someone else. So just like you and I belong to Father God, so our children belong to Father God. And we are the stewards of our children. Yes. All right. So we've talked about communication. Mm -hmm. We put it in a chat. We've talked about money. Mm -hmm. Put it in a chat. We've talked about children. 
put it in the chat. Our last point for today is we are going to talk about this last issue in marriage, which is intimacy slash sex. Yes. Intimacy slash sex. And we're going to read from 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, the third, fourth, and fifth verses. 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, the third through the fifth verses. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. And likewise, also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I, is that it? Mm -hmm. uh, because of your lack of self-control, verses three through five, right? And so in marriage, and we talked about this on our first session um, last week, um, Father God looks at sex um, in the confines of marriage. Mm -hmm. Father God made sex to be pleasurable, to be enjoyed, right? To be explored in the confines of marriage, right? And so Father God says, once you get into the marriage covenant, Pastor Roland, your body no longer belongs to you and your spouse's body no longer belongs to them, but your, your bodies belong to one another. Yes. Right? And it says here in verse number three, let uh, the husband render to his wife the affection that is due her. I think in King James it says uh, render to one another benevolence, render the benevolence, the affection, the consideration, right? And so husbands have a sexual need, right? And wives have a sexual need. And the Bible says that we are to render, to give, right, the affection that's due one another. That's right. That's right. And so when we talk about affection and intimacy, closeness, togetherness, all of those things um, add to the, uh, the sexual experiences and the sexual encounters that you have. So uh, the man has to be very uh, uh, careful and very aware of the wife's emotional needs, um, her psychological needs, her needs for closeness, her needs for intimacy, and not just the need for a sexual act. Men, basically, we can just want what we want and then that's it. We don't need all that other stuff, but the wife needs that. And so for it to be pleasurable for both people, you have to come together, you have to communicate, and you have to get on the same page in regards to that so that it can be pleasure for both people because if that need is not being met it can open a door for all types of um, uh, uh, things that you know we, I guess we can go into them we don't have to go into them but there's all types of things um, out there between uh, pornography and, and masturbation and uh, sex outside of marriage and uh, you know what do they call it side pieces and just all types of there's all types of things out there so we want to make sure that we're doing it God's way and we want to make sure that our, our spouse has the ability to be able to come to us if a need is not being met, if something uh, is needed and it's not been communicated or something is needed and it's not known, we have to be able to open up our mouths and not just assume that our spouse knows what we need. You got to be able to communicate what you need to your spouse so that you can get your needs met and uh, 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 it can be a, a, a sense of a, a joy and celebration and not a frustration and uh, aggravation. <laughs> right. And so even in this scripture, Pastor Roland, it says here um, in verse Verse number five, do not deprive one another except with consent. So you're going to talk about, okay, we're not going to be sexually active right now because we're fasting, right? Uh, we're not going to be sexually active right now. We're fasting and praying, yeah. right? But the Bible says, but you only do that for a time. And he's giving wisdom. You only do it for a time that you, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again mm -hmm. so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Right, because sexual energy, it doesn't just disappear, it goes somewhere. Mm, say it again. Sexual energy does not just disappear, it goes somewhere. Mm -hmm. So if a husband and wife are not being intimate together, that sexual energy is releasing itself somehow. Mm -hmm. So you gotta be careful and not thinking, oh, we're not doing anything, it's okay. No, that is being, that need is going to be met. And if it's not being met the way God ordained, it's being met in a way that God did not ordain, then that shouldn't be um, uh, an option when it comes to people that are married. 
And so, Pastor Ron, those other ways are pseudo, right? Pseudo ways. So, um, if it's masturbation, God did not intend for the believer who is married, right, to have to go to a pseudo, right? right? If it's pornography, God did not intend. Remember, we talked about God's intention, and we find out his intention from the beginning, right? What he said in Genesis. So he said, the two shall become one flesh. So it was God's intention that all sexual energy, right, um, be handled by e each other, by yes. the spouses, right? That's right. That we would take care of that need. And so whenever you find yourself having to go to masturbation, whenever you find yourself having to go to pornography, whenever you find yourself having to go to someone else that is not your spouse, it is because now Satan has come in, right, to deceive you. Well, it says Satan has come in to tempt you. Yes. Now, Pastor Roland, one of the things that we're seeing in society right now, that couples are indulging in pornography together. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what is that? Uh, how do we need to um, view that? And how do we need to operate as believers when it comes to, you know, maybe the husband said, come on, baby, let's watch this together. Or the wife says, baby, let's watch this together. Yeah, I think it's a lot of perversion that's out there. And to get to the root of it, um, is it can be very difficult at times. So if you're having any challenges or experiences uh, in these areas, uh, we uh, recommend that you seek some type of therapy, some type of counseling so that you can get a clearer understanding. Uh, you may have had sexual experiences at a very young age, and so now you got a perverted view of it. You may have been uh, mistreated or mishandled by a loved one or a family member, and you've been, uh, you know, um, you've kind of gotten off skew a little bit. A lot of times, the very first experience you have kind of dictates what you're going to have the rest of your life, and if it's a perversion, if it's a, 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 an abuse, a, a molestation or something like that, that sets the, the, the course. So we, you need to be able to deal with that. Uh, there are people that are qualified and professionals. Um, I think for a long time, you know, in the church, we just said, Let's, we'll just pray for you, put some oil on your head, pray for you, and send you on your way. Uh, we believe in the power of anointing with oil. We believe in the power of prayer. But I also believe that there are people that are counselors out there. There are Christian counselors out there. There are worldly counselors that have been trained and understand uh, how you can unpack some of those things and kind of get you on the right road to being able to uh, enjoy the intimacy and the sexual pleasure that God has uh, designed for us to enjoy. So, you know, I want to encourage anyone out there, if you need um, some help, to reach out uh, to someone that you trust. Reach out and find someone that can help you in, in, in therapy and counseling. And then also those of you that are believers, go to your man and woman of God so that we can do a spiritual approach, they can do a natural approach, and together I believe that you can find the freedom that you're looking for. Yes, because Pastor Rella, one of the... Um one of the things that we must understand is that the indulgence in pornography is an entryway for Satan, right? And what, what the indulgence in pornography will do, it will rob you of intimacy. Yes. So at first, you know how Satan is, you always say, you're right, he'll show you one thing, but behind it is another, right? So he'll say, yeah, come on and watch the pornography because it's going to make you, um, you know, more sexually heightened or whatever. But in the end, it will actually start robbing you of intimacy. As you said before, Pastor Ron, there is a difference between intimacy and sex, yes. right? Um, sex is just the act, right? Um, the act. But before you get to that act, there should be intimacy be uh, in, in a couple's life. There should be intimacy between spouses, right? That consideration, that love, that affection. And when we bring in pseudo things, it begins to rob us of the intimacy. That's right. So let's turn uh, here a little bit and talk about our love languages. There are five love languages. So you're talking about intimacy and, and, and moving to that point of, of pleasure. We want to have our five love languages, and one of these is yours. You might have more than one, but everybody has at least one of these love languages. The number one is words of encouragement. That is when you are specifically, when you know your spouse's love language and your spouse's love language is words of encouragement, now you're going to strategically, intentionally, and deliberately, deliberately say things to them that encourage them because that is their love language. You're going to identify a love language. You can go on YouTube. You can go on Google. They have tests. You can go and fill out what do you, what, which ones of these do you like. You fill it out, and they'll be like, this is your love language. And from there, then you can begin to strategically do what, what uh, uh, encourages your spouse. Spouse and what turns your spouse on. Absolutely. And during the course of marriage, Pastor Roland, maybe your love language changed. Mm -hmm. it, it, it may have been one thing at the beginning, and now you're 10 years, 20, 30 years in, and maybe your love language has changed. We got to go back to um, point number one, communication. You got to communicate your love language. Baby, I like when you encourage me. Yes. Um, give the example, Pastor Roland, as far as you speaking. Oh, yeah, so, um, you know, I, I speak pretty much here every Sunday at church, 
and I really need my wife to tell me how great and dynamic and how I'm just the best preacher and teacher she's ever seen. So when we get in the car, by the time we turn out of the parking lot onto 4th Street, if she hasn't said something to me about my message, I'm kind of in my feelings because I expect to hear it as soon as we're in. Don't let me hit 4th Street and you don't tell me, oh, that was awesome. You know, when did the Lord get that to you? Before we hit 4th Street, or I'm going to have my mouth poked out. She's going to be like, you want to eat? No. Why not? Because you have not encouraged me and tell me how dynamic of a speaker I am and you just don't know where this stuff comes from and the Lord is really using you and you are Mr. Anointed. I need to hear that before we hit 4th Street. And so my, one of my love languages is words of encouragement. All right. The second type of love language is quality time. Quality time is just that, where it's just no children, no distraction, it's just quality time. Some of you need quality time, just you and your spouse. If that's what you need, you got to communicate that and then set aside time where you get that quality time. It doesn't just happen uh, haphazardly, it's planned. Mm -hmm. And you have to share that, right? So I think that's one of my love languages, is quality time. I love for us to go places, travel, experience things together. So I love quality time. Right. And so you have to make that known and you say, well, you know, right now we don't have the budget to spend quality time like that. You can do it on a, a small budget. Right. Pastor Roland driving over to the coast or driving up to the home, whatever. Just that quality time where you can laugh, talk and just share. Right. Yes. Number three. Number three is physical touch. Uh, one of my wife's uh, also. Um, uh, language, love languages is physical touch. She's always grabbing my hand. Uh, she'll hit my leg, hit my leg when walking into a store. You won't hold my hand. We've been married to be 30 years in a, in a, in one year. To be 30 years has been 29, and she still wants me to hold her hand. She still wants me to rub her feet and things like that. And so she is uh, 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 known for, or, or one of her love languages, I should say, is physical touch. It's physical touch. But I would say that's one of yours as well. Uh, that's probably all men. Yeah. Yeah. I would say so too. But love languages, just because it's physical touch, doesn't mean it's going to end in sexual act. Right. So that's self control. That is self control, but it sure should end in there. <laughs> All right, number four, acts of service. <laughs> number four, acts of service. <laughs> the way I'm seeing it. <laughs> He said, always in there. All right, acts of service is like me doing things for you. Like my wife doesn't like to put gas in the car. She'll drive by four gas stations to tell me there's no gas in the car. So an act of service for me is to get the car washed and get the car uh, filled up with gas for her. That's an act of service. Um, she, she likes for me to, uh, she eats on the, sitting on the couch with the TV tray, watching the TV. She likes for me to take her dishes and put them in the sink. She likes for me to do these things. These are acts of service. So if I know that, I shouldn't be moaning and groaning and grunting and stuff. Like, you got two feet. Get up and do it yourself. Get up and get it yourself. <laughs> right? Um, so she um, likes acts of service as well. And I think, yeah, and so you have acts of service too. I think Pastor Roland um, likes when I take the initiative and maybe take something off his plate here at ministry. Like, so if I know um, there's things that need to be planned or things that need to be done, if I take that assignment and go ahead and work it out and make sure it's all done and then he finds out it's already taken care of, he goes, oh, thanks, you know? Yeah. That's an act of service, Absolutely. right? So whatever you know about your spouse, don't withhold it from it, from them do it yes right mm -hmm. do it right so number four is acts of service let's review number one was words of encouragement number two is quality time number three physical touch number four acts of service and number five receiving gifts all right so some people just really 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 like to receive gifts um i i uh, i like to receive gifts but i don't like make it known to everyone. Like we have members in our family that, okay, my birthday's in four weeks, this is what I want. My birthday's in three weeks, this is what I want. My birthday's in two weeks, this is what I want. My birthday is next week, this is what I want. They like to receive gifts. So we shouldn't be like, oh, here they go again. That's how they're wired. So we should do everything we can to accommodate them because that is how they wire. Other people, you know, my dad pulled me to the side and said, son, I don't want any more gifts from you guys. I got all this stuff now. And he told us, don't give me anything else for Christmas, don't give me anything else for my birthday because that was not his love language. So you have to understand how people are wired and give them what they want and what they need. Mm -hmm. So identify your personal love languages and then take the time to um, share or communicate it with your spouse, right? And vice versa. And you may have more than one love language or perhaps maybe your love language has changed since um, the first time, uh, since you were first married, right? When we talk about the act of sex, Pastor Roland, I think one of the things that has to be shared um, in, in marriage um, between spouses is 
um, frequency and expectations. Yes, you got to communicate. Just like anything else, you have got to communicate. If you're once a week and he's five times a week, you got to come to some common ground because it's going to cause some friction mm -hmm. if you're not on the same page. Don't just expect it to happen. Sometimes you got to plan for it to happen. I mean, there's like certain days of the week, this is what we're going to do. Don't make it seem like it's this big, huge, romantic thing every single time. It can be romantic, it can be spontaneous, you know, and it can be uh, all of those things, but, it, uh, you know, when you get going and you have children and you got life and things you can go a little bit longer than you want to don't expect people to be mind readers you got to communicate this is an issue mm -hmm. and we need to come to a resolution so I'm not being pulled in areas where I shouldn't be pulled right and so um, and like you said Pastor Rowan don't don't think don't get caught up in the movies like all the time your hair's supposed to be blowing back and you know y'all supposed to be swinging off the chandeliers that's Hollywood right sometimes you just got to put the work in right right sometimes you just got to do it because you know that's the thing we need to be doing Right. Right? Yeah, that's, that's not all the time. Not all the time. That's some of the time. Mm -hmm. I think they call it a quickie. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Amen. Amen. Thank God for the quickie. All right, the Bible says, we're wrapping it up. The Bible says in Hebrews, the sixth chapter and the ninth verse, but beloved, we are confident of better things mm -hmm. concerning you. Mm -hmm. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. We are confident of better things. We're teaching on hope because hope is a confident expectation of what? Better things. Put it in the chat. In your marriage, what is our confident expectation? Better, better things. things. In our money, what is our confident expectation? Better, better things. things. In our business and our career, what is our confident expectation? Better, better things. things. In our intimacy and sex life, what is our high uh, uh, expectation? Better, better things. things. With our relationship with our children, what is our confident expectation better, better things. things we are confident of better things he said things that accompany salvation that means what we have after we get saved should be better than what we have before we got saved that's good stuff amen 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 so this has been hope for marriage right and so next week will be hope for something else right mm -hmm. so this has been hope for marriage so right now we just want to pray for all the marriages father god we just thank you and praise you thank you for Jesus. all the marriages father here in compassion and those worldwide and we just thank you for every believer, Father God, who is thank married. Thank you, Father. And we just pray that uh, marriages and uh, spouses, Father God, put you back at the core. They'll go back and revisit their marriages. They'll go back, Father God, and communicate once again, Father God. They'll do some fine-tuning for the marriages, yes, Father God. God. So that marriages will be everything that you have intended, Father God. And we thank you that your intention for marriages have not changed. So, Father, we give you the glory, honor, and praise for those who are married. And we pray for those who are in the single state right now. If they have a desire to be married, Father God, we thank you that their spouse is on the way, Father God. We thank you that in whatever whatever area or whatever way we find ourselves, Father God, we are content. Yes, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for this teaching. We thank you that this teaching will bring life to marriages. In Jesus' name, Amen and amen. amen. Praise the name of Jesus. You're watching us um, today and you've never received Christ. That's the first thing you need to do um, to make your marriage better. Your marriage needs to be founded on Jesus. And it's very simple to do. The Bible says in Romans 10 and 9 and 10, if you'll believe Thank in you, your Jesus. heart, confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Today is your day. I know we've been talking about marriages, but it all begins with Jesus, right? So wherever you are, you say, you know what? I've tried everything. My spouse and I, we are at our, you know, wit's end. Try Jesus today. Give him an opportunity to come into your life, change it, and do something with it. Make it better, right? Those are the things he's promised. So if that's you, I want you to pray with me. Repeat this prayer because you believe it. You're ready to receive him. You're ready to give him an opportunity to make it better. Let's pray. Say, Father God. Father God. I come to you. I come to you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I believe. I believe. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Is your son. Is your son. And that Jesus. And that Jesus. Gave his life. Gave his life 
for me. For me. Father, Father, I ask you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. To forgive me of my sins. Wash me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Cleanse me. And receive me as your own. And receive me as your own. I accept Jesus. I accept Jesus as my Savior. As my Savior and Lord. And Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And man, and just like that, based on the belief of your heart, the confession of your mouth, you have now been translated into the family of God. We say today, welcome to the family of God. Yes, even talking about marriages, we say welcome to the family of God. Take your phone right now, wherever you are, and send us a text. That text should read hashtag I am saved. Send that to the number 54244. Send us a text. Hashtag I am saved. Send it to the number 54244. Follow the prompts. That way we'll know who you are. We have a gift from us to you. It's a book called uh, God's Promises for Your Every Need. We want to be a part of your growth in this new relationship. So go ahead and send that to us, and your book is on its way. If you've been partnering with Compassion, you've been worshiping with Compassion and learning and gleaning from what we have to offer, and you say, you know what, I want to become a, mem a member. We want you to take that phone and send us a text, hashtag members with an S, Send it, to, send it to the same number, 54244. You want to uh, go beyond just watching us and you want to partner and become a member with us, send a hashtag members to 54244. Follow the prompts. We'll know who you are and we'll contact you to uh, uh, let you know how to become an official member of Compassion Christian Center. You're not an island to yourself. You need a local body and we want to be that just for you. Welcome to the body of Christ. Yes, Amen. welcome to the body of Christ. Yes. yes. Grab your phone, shoot us a text. Yes. Well, with that, it's offering time. Uh, we are so excited about what God is doing here at Compassion Christian Center. Um, for those of you that have been watching any length of time, you know we've been in uh, uh, a remodel remodeling project for some years now, and uh, we did some upgrades during uh, COVID and even post-COVID, and so now we're in the last phase of the last part of phase one, which is new seating and new flooring, and we have begun that process. We're so excited about that, and then we're gonna have some other additional projects coming on. But right now, we're focused on the new seating and the flooring. We appreciate all of you for your ties, your offerings, your gifts of love, and those of you that have given your impact gifts. Thank yes. you so much. Yes. Everything we've done, we've been able to do cash money. We have yes. not been able to take out a loan, and that's because of your generosity. Give yourselves a great big hand clap. You're an amazing group. Yeah, put fire in the chat. And uh, we're excited about what God is doing. We have multiple ways for you to give. Yes. Uh, you can text to give. You can go to our secure website. All of that should be on the screen. What you need to text, our website. You can write a check, mail it to our physical address, 10304th Street. If you're old school and want to write a check, we love checks. In the mail, you can bring it by the office. We have people that come by the office regularly to drop off their tithes, their offerings, their gifts of love, and their donations to the Ministry of Compassion Christian Center. Uh, those of you that made pledges for the um, impact giving, we need you to honor your pledges and yes. be consistent in that so we can continue to move and not have any gaps because of a, a, a slow um, uh, uh, income. So we want to make sure that we're staying on top of that. Listen, no matter what you pledge, it's important. Don't let the enemy talk you out of it. Oh, this little $50 is not important. This little $100 is not important. You get enough 50s, enough hundreds, it adds up to thousands, believe me. So we want to encourage all of you to honor your impact giving and continue to give because you can't beat God giving no matter how you try. So the ways to give are on the screen there. Thank God for technology where people can click buttons and go on websites and things like that and give and thank God for old school checks in uh, 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 pens to be able to give that way. Uh, we're excited about what God is doing. Thank you so much once again for your generosity. Lift your hands. Look at your hands and say, these hands. Come on, say it like you mean it. These hands are anointed to harvest, to gather, and to reap on assignment. And everything these hands touch prospers. Amen. And amen. Thank you so much for every gift, every donation. We thank God that it is abounding to your life in Jesus' name. We also want to say thank you to every single member and partner that went to Greater Harvest Christian Center with Pastor Roland Wright on Thursday for empowerment session. Thank you so much, and thank you for everyone who's already purchased the book. Remember, the book is available to you on Amazon and everywhere that books are sold. We are so excited about what God is going to do in the earth through this book, and it's just a pleasure to be a part of his team. Is that right, Pastor yes, Roland? 
Rhodes. That's right. So we love you. We love you so much. Thank you so much. It's always a wonderful thing, Pastor Rowan, when you have to go and do something and you have a team of people that are there to support you, right? That's right. That's so right. We, we don't take it for granted. We appreciate you yes. more than you know. Yes. I'm excited. The title of the book is Quiet Time, A Guide to Experience the Lord in a Personal and Powerful Way. And uh, there is the book. There is the journal. And I'm also going to be doing a master class. So we'll be getting some more information about. I want some students in the class. I want to be able to share with you uh, some of the things the Lord shared with me. And then I want to hear from you some of the things. Some of you have been doing quiet time and you read through this. You'd be like, oh, I never thought about that. Let me incorporate it. There's something that you do that I haven't thought about. Let's grow together. Listen for the announcement for the quiet time master class with Pastor Roland. This is going to be our textbook that we're using. And we're too excited about that. Um, my website is up, rbmint.com, rbmint.com. You can go on there and get some more information. And you can also order the book on rbmint.com. There's also some merch and some other stuff on there. There's a lot, and I'm not trying to give it all at one time, but I'm just trying to roll it out bit by bit. That's it. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for this time gathering together in your name. We thank you to dismiss us from this place. Oh, God, traveling grace is ours. Every time we go, everywhere we go, we thank you and we praise you, Father, that you promised us in Psalms 91, verse 16, with long life you satisfy us and show us your salvation. We thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For me to fail, me to fail. Impossible. impossible. For you to fail, for you to fail. Impossible. impossible. Hit that share button and be blessed. <laughs>